All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. So today we'll be reviewing some of the basic cell structures uh, that were also discussed in the pre-lecture video. Uh, we'll also be talking about uh, specifically cell membrane structure, what it's composed of, and how that and the subsequent uh, roles and functions of, of each of the components of the cell membrane. And finally, we'll be relating all of this to the pathogenesis of lupus. Uh, so the word pathogenesis, uh, you can think of it as breaking it down. And typically, uh, for longer clinical terms, it kind of helps to break it down. Uh, it's what it means is it's. Uh, we're trying to define the origin of the pathology. How did this disease begin? So lupus, the, the longer clinical name for it is systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, or we can just call it lupus. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease associated with antibodies against nuclear proteins. Uh, does anyone want to help us define what an autoimmune disease is? Yes? A disease where the uh, body particular attacks itself auto. Yep. So Exactly. Uh, typically, our immune systems are designed to identify self as self and foreign pathogens as foreign and attack and protect us from them. Uh, autoimmune diseases are when the self is identified or some specific part of the self is identified as foreign and attacked. And in this case, yes. That's exactly right. Thank you. Um, and so in this case, the self that's identified as foreign is nuclear proteins. Some of the symptoms associated uh, with lupus, you can, you can imagine that nuclear proteins are in, are in just about every cell. So the symptoms uh, associated with lupus are going to be pretty uh, broadly, uh, are going to present pretty broadly. So we typically there's fatigue, there's joint pain, there's photosensitivity. Uh, in addition to that, there's this malar rash. Uh, there's this rash that kind of this, the butterfly-like rash that occurs uh, across the cheeks, or across the face. And what's interesting is that uh, the the word lupus. Does anyone know uh, where the word lupus comes from, or what, like its origin? Think of like any sci-fi movie. Yeah, exactly right. Yes. Um, a 13th century doctor noticed that typically people who suffer from a wolf bite develop this like rash across their face. And so similarly, uh, those who have uh, lupus develop a rash like that. It's not that they're clinically related, but rather that uh, a doctor hundreds of years ago thought they looked the same. And because of that, the name for this disease uh, has lupus in it. Uh, there's kind of little like interesting anecdotes like that with a lot of different clinical diseases or stories. Yes? Why do patients uh, again, that's, that's one, that's one place where, uh, why the rash specifically on the face? I don't know. Um, but again, lupus, the way it presents, it affects nearly every organ. And, uh, when it becomes fatal is when there's sufficient damage, uh, autoimmune damage to organs where the patient will enter into organ failure. Um, there's also anemia. Uh, as we defined last class, that's a loss of a reduced or reduction in red blood cells. And it's also lupus has also been dubbed the great imitator. That's because if you look at these symptoms, fatigue, joint pain, anemia, photosensitivity, these are pretty broad and pretty general. And so it's hard to clinically identify lupus early. And it can oftentimes present as potentially something else. And so because of this, uh, it's oftentimes not diagnosed until early adulthood. The current clinical standard for diagnosing lupus is finding autoantibodies, so antibodies against itself, autoantibodies for nuclear proteins. Yes? Uh, not necessarily widespread, but uh, uh, organ failure for specific critical organs. Like there's lupus nephritis is one manifestation of lupus. Uh, and over time, you'll, you'll have uh, tissue damage in the kidney that can be fatal. Yes. 
This disease alternates between flare-ups and periods of remission. Um, typically, uh, remission is when the, the symptoms are no longer present. Uh, and there's, and that, that can make it sometimes hard to, uh, hard to adequately treat because there's these periods where you're not presenting with it and then times where it's uh, quite problematic. Impact of it. So the prevalence and incidence. Currently, uh, the, pre the current prevalence rate for it is that there's probably 1.5 1. 1. million people in the U.S. and 5 million people worldwide with lupus. But again, it can be hard to identify because it is the great imitator. So the numbers, these numbers are, are an, uh, likely an underestimation of the true number of people suffering from lupus. Uh, women are 90 times more likely to develop lupus than men. This is actually pretty true across most autoimmune diseases. Uh, unfortunately, women are more susceptible uh, to autoimmune diseases in general. And in addition to that, uh, women of color are typically even more likely uh, than their Caucasian counterparts to uh, suffer from autoimmune diseases. Yes. Uh, it varies from autoimmune disease to autoimmune disease. Um, for lupus, I don't know why. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going through like a few different autoimmune diseases in my head to see if I can identify anything. Um, it, it's hard to identify why. Um, there are some reasons perhaps for older women uh, that have gone through childbirth um, where if you can imagine like there's something kind of foreign for lack of a better phrase growing inside of you. And so your immune system is slightly immunosuppressed for those nine months. Uh, so as not to have, uh, so as not to mount an immune response, and with each subsequent uh, childbirth, uh, women become can become uh, more, slightly immunocompromised. Yeah, so I mean, there are there are women who are uh, in adolescents who can develop autoimmune diseases, like one that's. One that's somewhat common among adolescent women is like uh, Hashimoto's disease. Um, like there were in my PhD lab, uh, there were two women that had Hashimoto's. Uh, and typically lupus is diagnosed in early adulthood. MS is typically diagnosed in later adulthood. Um, but the unfortunate common thread through all of them is that women are more susceptible. But we don't, There's there's no like, common theme as to why that's the case. Uh, the economics for lupus is that the in the US, the current direct expenditures is $18 billion. Yes? Sorry, did you mention that um, for the milk space of women, is that two to three times more likely than women or just uh, Two to three times more likely than Caucasian women. So it's for... Uh, for women of color, they have the highest burden for uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, so uh, for lupus, the direct expenditures is $18 billion. Direct expenditures mean, means that uh, costs related to directly to therapy and treatment. Indirect expenditures typically are associated with loss of income and like other uh, subsequent consequences to the disease. Uh, ideology. Uh, the ideology, the cause for lupus is unknown. Uh, a large fancy clinical term for unknown ideology is idio idiopathic. Uh, there are genetic environmental factors at play. Uh, and the current opinion is that uh, it's not that the environment plays a role, but can perhaps exacerbate it and lead to some of these flare ups that we see. Uh, and the pathogenesis is not entirely known, but we're going to talk about one potential mechanism that might explain what causes lupus. So we're gonna be talking about this in the context of the cell membrane. And so we're gonna try and break down the cell membrane a little bit into its constitutive parts and talk about what, uh, what their each contributing role is to the, to the overall function of the cell membrane. We have our lipid bilayer that are constitute, uh, constituted by phospholipids uh, as well as cholesterol. What's really important to note is that the, lipid, the phospholipid bilayer helps provide a barrier between the extracellular and intracellular uh, compartments and helps maintain concentration gradients. And these concentration gradients are critical. Um, the, and there's also proteins littered across throughout the entire cell membrane. And so while the phospholipid helps provide that barrier function that helps maintain a concentration gradient, every other function related to cell membranes 
can be attributed to the proteins present. And these proteins that are present are usually unique from cell, from, di from dif across different cells. What's important to note is that lipid bilayer does not equal cell membrane. It is a part of it, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not that whenever we talk about cell membrane, you can't, uh, it's, it's important to note that you can't use lipid bilayer and cell membrane interchangeably. Because again, proteins are part of the cell membrane and have critical uh, features uh, that are important to the, to the function. The phospholipid structure. Uh, so these, we, we can, we're going to break this down a little bit to help uh, try and provide some specificity to the different kinds of phospholipids that can be part of the lipid bilayer. So each phospholipid is constituted by this hydrophobic, hydrophobic fatty acid uh, taint, uh, chain uh, that's then connected to uh, a glycerol group. And from there, it's uh, connected to a phosphate head right here. And so th these three components, the fatty acid chain, glycerol, and phosphate, are three pieces that are present on every phospholipid within the, phos within the lipid bilayer. The, where it becomes more specific is the alcohol group to the, uh, to the far right here. So what we have here is choline. And so there are actually, so the three, uh, the three pieces that are general to each uh, phospholipid is called phosphatidic acid. And once you include the alcohol, it, uh, the, the, name, the naming convention becomes somewhat formulaic. So it becomes phosphatidyl, and then you have the name of the alcohol. So what we have here is phosphatidyl choline. We have four alcohol groups that can be, uh, that are typically present in our phospholipids within the lipid bilayer. Uh, we have choline, serine, ethanolamine, and inositol. And so whichever one it is, it'd be phosphatidyl and then the name of that alcohol group. And the alcohol determines, again, this is the, uh, if there's to be like one key takeaway here, the alcohol group defines the, the specificity of that phospholipid. And so what we have here is the uh, each phospholipid uh, present here in, a, in, in the lipid bilayer. So as I mentioned before, the fatty acid chain is hydrophobic. And as we talked about uh, during the amino acid lecture before, to, within proteins, the, uh, in an aqueous environment, those hydrophobic regions are going to be turning inward. What happens here is that when there's spontaneous development uh, of phospholipids present together, you'll have a bilayer that forms where the hydrophobic tails are turned inward and the polar head groups uh, are gonna be facing outward to either the extracellular or intracellular compartments. And <clears throat> what's important to note is that uh, this formation of the lipid bilayer is driven by hydrophobic forces. And in addition to that, if you look at some of the fatty acid, ta uh, fatty acid tails here, what you can appreciate is that they're not straight lines. Um, I've, there's usually like a shorthand that people draw when they're drawing a lipid bilayer, but in, in actual biology, those tails are not straight. They're usually, uh, they usually have kinks in them. And that kinking is gonna be pretty critical and we're gonna talk about why that happens later on. Uh, before I move any further, are there any questions yet? I'm gonna stop for a couple, I'm gonna drink some water and stop for a couple of questions. Yes. Yes. Do the tails themselves like run across from each other, walk to towards each other generally, or away from each other, or does it not reach out when, when making the bilayer? Uh, they're typically they're typically at homeostasis when they're like facing each other and like in somewhat contact, but not like inter uh, interweaving each other. They're not going to do that because there's strong enough repulsion from the polar head groups for them to kind of like stay apart from each other. Does that make sense? So like four hands. I think I saw your hand go up first. You said caused by proline? Uh, no, that's a good question. But no, uh, we'll 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 get. Uh, I hope I, I think we'll get to why that happens. I uh, I'm gonna go down the line. Yes. Uh, tip, uh, typically, it's by nature of how these phospholipids are synthesized. Um, and uh, and there, there, are like, there are enzymes, there are uh, enzymes that help mediate the formation of these phospholipids. 
And so it, it's a matter of, we're gonna talk about the distance on the next slide of like how thick the cell membrane is, but typically that the phospholipids are synthesized by these enzymes. And then that will determine how long the tail is and uh, subsequent attachment of other groups that create the whole phospholipid. I'm gonna go two last questions here. Yes, in the back. Yes. You're stealing my content. But you're you're 100 you're 100 right. That, that's exactly right. But we'll be uh, we'll be talking about that, and I'll turn back to you in ten slides. Final question. Yes. Like wh just what it is, because like every phospholipid has phosphatidic acid, fatty acid chain, glycerol, phosphate group. Then that alcohol, there's four different kinds that we showed on the previous slide. Uh, what ex what phospholipid that is exactly is defined by what alcohol is there. So it's typically helpful to get a sense of the scale of things when we're talking about cells, cell membranes. Uh, typically, a cell membrane is approximately four nanometers thick. Uh, and nanometers is 10 to the minus nine meters. Uh, typically, proteins can range in size from as small as one nanometer up to one nanometer up to 100 nanometers, and that is typically dependent on their uh, their mat, their size, and their shape, their size and their shape. And finally, a typical cell, uh, typical is uh, in quotes here because all cells, uh, there's so many different cell populations that can vary in size, but on average, typically a cell is about 10 microns or 10 micrometers in diameter. Uh, to give you a little bit of context for that, a human hair is 20 to 200 microns, depending on uh, how fine it is. So if we said on average a human hair is 100 microns th uh, thick, uh, that means uh, that means 10 cells stacked together is equivalent to the thickness of one hair. So this is to give you another snapshot and appreciation of what uh, a phospholipid bilayer looks like. We have our polar head groups on top. If I can have my mouse, there we go. Polar head groups on top. Um, we have the the these hydrophobic fatty acid uh, tails here, and then the other uh, polar head group there. And you can envision that perhaps this is the extracellular region, the region outside of a cell above, and the intracellular or inside the cell region below. So there is a model to help us understand or define uh, how uh, a cell membrane moves and functions. Uh, it's called a fluid mosaic model. Uh, so we believe that the lipid bilayer is this semi-fluid uh, structure where typically uh, typically uh, the lipid bilayer is not a stationary object, that there's wiggling and there's moving. And that degree of wiggling and moving kind of goes up and down with temperature. Meaning that, uh, for example, if you were working in a research lab and you wanted to try and uh, investigate or assess a protein or something on the cell membrane, or perhaps signaling that occurs across the cell membrane, you'd put your cells on ice to try and stop that wiggling. Because again, uh, the proteins that are present in our cell membrane, they can move across laterally. And that's, per that's permitted by the semi-fluid-like nature of the lipid bilayer. And so, the fluid compart the fluid portion of this model is the lipid bilayer. It, uh, at, at normal physiological temperatures, at 37 degrees Celsius, there's wiggling and there's moving. And then embedded within this lipid bilayer, we have cholesterol, but we also have protein. Protein is that mosaic part of this model where uh, they're able to move laterally across the lipid bilayer, uh, typically not in and out, but like move in, uh, across the plane of the lipid bilayer because there's this fluid-like nature to it that permits uh, movement as, as it wiggles and moves. And we're going to you're, you're also stealing my content. We're going we're to tackle that. We're going to tackle that in a moment. Um, so typically, proteins uh, there are different ways in which proteins are associated with the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, there are some that are peripheral membrane proteins, meaning that they're on top, sitting on top of the uh, 
lipid bilayer. And typically those are driven by ionic bonds because again, we have a polar head group on top, a polar head group on top uh, on which it's sitting. And so the ionic bond uh, between the polar head group and that uh, peripheral protein helps secure it in that spot. Uh, another class of protein in this uh, is lipid, lipid anchored proteins. While the anchor appears to be attached to the polar head group, it's typically actually wedged into the lipid bilayer. As you can imagine, it's a lipid tail, which means it's typically, uh, typically doesn't have a charge, meaning it's hydrophobic. So it's typically that uh, lipid anchor is wedged into this hydrophobic region of the lipid bilayer. And finally, we also have integral membrane proteins. Uh, integral membrane proteins are actually wedged straight into uh, the cell membrane. And you can imagine that if it if an integral membrane looks like if an integral membrane protein uh, is situated like this, that means that this region of the protein, do you think would be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? I heard like three whispers of hydrophobic, which would be correct. And if that region would be hydrophobic, the region up here would be, there you go. That was a little more confident, you guys. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, some integral membrane proteins are actually able to traverse across the entire length of the cell membrane, meaning that it has hydrophilic and uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and then hydrophilic regions uh, across the length of this protein. As I mentioned earlier, the, the proteins that are uh, either wedged or sitting on top of the lipid bilayer, because the lipid bilayer has this fluid-like nature to it, they're able to move laterally uh, and diffuse across the cell membrane. Um, if you know, if you had, if we had uh, a really powerful microscope and if we tagged one protein with a fluorescent marker, and if we were able to like look at it like wiggling, we'd be able to see it wiggling across the cell membrane over time. So we talked last class about secondary structures, and one of them being alpha helices, and that the side chains face outward uh, on these alpha helices. Uh, for hydro, uh, for integral transmembrane proteins, uh, they're going to the, the portion that's transmembrane or going across the membrane is an alpha helix, and those side chains, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be hydrophobic because again, it's being wedged into where the fatty acid hydrophobic tails are, and so you can always think this region is always going to uh, anything that is at homeostasis within the membrane in this region is going to is going to be a hydrophobic region outside on the extracellular or intracellular compartment, those are gonna be hydrophilic regions of the protein. And so the side, the amino acids present, the amino acids on the, uh, hydro, on the alpha helix that crosses the membrane is gonna be hydrophobic. And this protects the, uh, uh, the polar backbone of uh, the amino acid, the, the polar backbone of the amino acid sequence there. So, as we described before, we have on alpha helix, we have for every turn of an alpha helix, that's about half a nanometer in distance. Across that turn are going to be 3.6 amino acids. So taking that information together uh, to uh, try and test your understanding, a, tr a transmembrane protein re would require how many consecutive hydrophobic amino acids if it was a, uh, if it was a uh, transmembrane protein. And one thing I'll add is that if, uh, also remembering that the cell membrane is four nanometers thick. So you can do, a, uh, so we're gonna take a moment to do a back of the napkin calculation. You can confer with your neighbors, uh, but try and take a moment to think Knowing that the cell membrane is four nanometers thick, that we have half a nanometer between each turn and 3.6 amino acids per turn, how many consecutive hydrophobic amino acids would we need for a transmembrane protein? So we'll take 30 seconds. <laughs> 
approximately. This is a ballpark back of the napkin calculation. Yes. Yeah, so what I was saying is that uh, for transmembrane proteins, the part that goes across the membrane is an alpha helix. That's its secondary structure. Mm -hmm. Its secondary structure is alpha. Correct. Oh, and so, okay. because if you remember, the, the, I forgot to mention this. So with beta sheets, the side groups point up, point down, point up, point down, point up. Both alpha helix are all pointing outward. And so because of that, uh, any protein that has a transmembrane part, that part will be that part will be an alpha helix. And so uh, secondary structures on the alpha helix. Yes, that that that's the that's the takeaway message for that slide. Yes. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and uh, keep going. Uh, does anyone want to jump in and say what, uh, what the answer is? Probably 25. So do you want to explain how you got that? So if each turn is about 0.54 nanometers in width, and the width of the cell membrane is four, that means we need about eight-ish turns. So each turn has 3.6 um, amino acids. Mm -hmm. uh, protein, sorry. Amino acids. Amino acids, yeah. Stick with your gut. So you got it right the first time. 3.6 times eight, roughly 25. Roughly 25. That's exactly right. So just to quickly repeat that for the sake of the recording, now that I'm thinking out loud, um, knowing that the cell membrane is four nanometers thick um, and that it's half a nanometer per turn, you'll need about approximately eight turns uh, of your alpha helix across to cross the entire membrane. And knowing that we have 3.6 amino acids per turn, you'll need about 25. So one question to consider is, uh, are, are you able to identify a, a membrane-spanning protein simply by its amino acid sequence? I know what you're all thinking. The answer is yes. Um, we use what's called a hydropathy plot. What it does is it looks at each amino acid one at a time, and there's a bar up here that slides across where the red, bar, where the red box uh, is the amino acid that it's specifically looking at at each spot. And these gray bars uh, next to them also are weighing, considering the adjacent amino acids and whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And so what'll happen is it'll slide across uh, and uh, it'll slide across and determine the degree of hydrophobicity or hydrophil how hydrophilic it is. And looking at the y-axis uh, above, uh, above zero are, uh, Amino acids that are more hydrophobic, and below the zero uh, below the zero axis is uh, more hydrophilic. And so, to help try and display this, I'm going to try and point at this hydropathy plot and point at this protein to try and demonstrate this. So, if you think about this uh, for a moment, for the peaks that we see. Where in the lipid bilayer do you think is the most hydrophobic region? Right in the middle. So right here, straight in the middle, would be a peak. Where are possible places that might be the, uh, the most hydrophilic? The, uh, uh, would just one or both? Both, correct. So the peak down below would be either... I'll say IC, intracellular, EC, rectocellular. Uh, that bottom, those bottom peaks would either be out here or out here. And so to help illustrate this, I'm gonna try and uh, trace my hand, this protein here and this hydropathy plot here. So we're starting out here because this is the end terminus. So it's on the outside. So that means it's at this uh, most hydrophilic part. As I start to go down, if I was reading the amino acid sequence, as I'm going into the cell membrane, this is gonna start going up. And so this peak now is where I'm at the very inner part, very middle of the phospholipid bilayer. And as I start going out, it's gonna come back down, okay? So one entire, one peak, uh, what's a good way to say this? 
uh, a peak up in the hydrophobic region coming back down, that's one transmembrane portion of a protein. All right. So now if I go back up towards the um, middle of the fossil lipid bilayer, I'm going back up and then I'm going to come back down as I go back out to the extracellular region. So you can look at a hydropathy plot and see how many transmembrane parts of a protein there is. Yes. Uh, does anyone want to venture a guess how many transmembrane portions that protein has simply by looking at the hydropathy plot? Yeah, four. So again, the very top is being in the middle of the lipid bilayer. So it's going into the very middle and it's coming back out. So like going up and going back down, that's one entire portion of a, a protein that has gone across the cell membrane. So this has gone across the cell membrane, this has gone across the cell me membrane, this part and this part. And then once we get down here, uh, it's in the more hydrophilic region. So that means it's either on the inside or outside of the cell. In this case, this protein is tetraspanin. So this is a tail, the C terminus is inside uh, on the intracellular portion of the cell. And there's the bar sliding across. So <clears throat> to, uh, to reiterate what we said earlier, um, the, lipid, the phospholipid bilayer has a critical function as a barrier that helps to maintain concentration gradients. But so many of the functions that we attribute to cell membranes um, are assisted or permitted by the proteins that are present there. And so there are different membrane functions associated with these, uh, some of these proteins. We have uh, the function of compartmentalization, and that can be broken down further into localization of function or raising concentrations. So the localization of function, you can think of that relative to like the nucleus or even the lysosome. In the nucleus, we have gene transcription that occurs there, and a nucleus has its own membrane that restricts that function to within the nucleus. Excuse me. Uh, within the lysosome, there's also a membrane around lysosomes that uh, restrict and maintain uh, the function of breaking down and degrading uh, waste products or foreign pathogens within the membrane of the lysosome. Uh, in addition, again, raising of concentrations, uh, there are proteins that help shuttle across within the lysosome uh, hydrogen ions that help lower the pH so it becomes really acidic to degrade and break down waste products or foreign pathogens within the lysosome. And those are facilitated by proteins that help with that transport. Uh, we have regulation of transport. Uh, there are proteins on our cell membrane that help shuttle either ions, shuttle uh, different biomolecules across the cell membrane for a variety of functions, but that's, per, that's enabled by these transport proteins on the cell membrane. Uh, another is the binding of ligands by receptors. And so on our, on our cells, there are these proteins that serve as receptors that bind to a ligand uh, and that mediate transduction in, uh, intracellularly. Uh, and, and so in this case, this is uh, I drew uh, integrin proteins that bind to like our, uh, our extracellular matrix. That's kind of like they're binding to their environment and grabbing on. And what ends up happening is that there's downstream signaling on the C terminus end of, of integrin. And in addition to that, these proteins on our cell membrane can bind to other cells, or like I just described here, can bind to a substrate, bind to their environment. So integrins are known to either uh, this is just an example of a, a receptor, an example of a protein on our cell surfaces. Um, they will bind either to their environment, bind to collagen, fibronectin, or they might be binding to other cells. So, for example, if you are, uh, if you accidentally bust your lip open, uh, there are going to be immune cells that rush to that location. And the way they get to that specific location is that there are uh, proteins that are expressed in our blood vessels at that location and immune cells are flowing through our bloodstream, and they have these integrins, and they bind to a specific ligand, and that ligand is what our blood vessels are expressing. So basically, they have the integrin out, blood vessels have this ligand out to catch them, immune cells bind to it, and are able to locate to that specific site of injury and help uh, begin immediate healing. Yes? Uh, you said versus ligand or ligand? Both are fine. There are... Uh, over time, you'll realize that there are 
multiple different ways people pronounce things. And sometimes it's even regional. Um, I did uh, my work in immunology and I always say macrophage. People from New York like to say macrophage. I always think it's funny, but uh, that, yeah, so it's totally fine. Yes. So you guys know what a ligand does? A ligand is what a receptor binds to. So, so uh, just to keep it simple, receptors bind to specific ligands. Integrin, uh, that was me just trying to use, uh, that's an example I was just trying to use here. So like, this is not something you need to memorize, but it's just an example, an anecdote or an example I was trying to use to illustrate this. Integrins are just uh, cell surface receptors that bind to their environment or can bind to other, uh, other uh, cells with specific, if they have that ligand on their surface. How is what not the same as a ligand? Forgive me. Those are... Those, these are receptors. They are, uh, their job is to bind to specific ligands that they are made to recognize. Does that help clarify a little bit? Okay. This isn't critical. This is not, this is just an example. This isn't critical to, this is not critical to this lecture. It'll be critical to when we get to the ECM uh, lecture, so. That's a, uh, so don't get stuck on on this, but the question of receptors and ligands is good to know. So receptors are ma are made to bind to specific ligands, the things that they bind to. Yes. What is a ligand? It's uh, a, a ligand is just something that a receptor binds to. Does that help me clarify? Okay. Uh, so membrane fluidity. So. If the membrane becomes, uh, if the phospholipid bilayer becomes too solid, uh, that membrane will now, the membrane proteins will cease to function normally. Um, they need to be able to move laterally uh, to perform their function. They need to be able to diffuse across the membrane. And so avoiding, uh, avoiding a, a solid state is, is critical. And so what the way that's, the way, one of the ways in which that's enabled is by uh, the degree of unsaturation in the fatty acid tails of the lipid, uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, and so, uh, do we? Does anyone want to venture a description of what unsaturation is? Yeah. Say it again. Exactly, yeah. So for the sake of recording, I'll say it again. So uh, the degree of saturation is defined by the presence of double bonds. Uh, and the consequence of that is having these like unoccupied hydrogen bind bind uh, binding spots. But to, uh, to, more for, uh, to keep it simpler for visual sake as well, um, the more double bonds are present, the more unsaturated the fatty acid is. If it is, if the, the less double bonds, is particularly if it has no double bonds, that is a saturated fatty acid. And so what's really important here is that uh, the presence of these double bonds can uh, induce kinks and reduce the crystallinity or the ordering. And so that helps enable the, uh, enable the fluidity here. So we have, uh, we have above, we have steric acid, that's a saturated fatty acid. If that was what occupied or constituted our, li our lipid bilayer, um, that would have such a high degree of crystallinity, it would not enable or permit movement across the cell membrane. However, the, uh, the fatty acids that, have, that are unsaturated, that have double bonds, particularly ones that have a kink, enable that movement. And so if, you can, if, you, if you're looking at the slide, you can see that there are two that have double bonds, but one that has a kink. And that's defined by uh, the nature of that double bond, whether it's cis or trans. So the cis double bonds have uh, their hydrocarbon arms pointing in the same direction, and the trans have them pointing in the opposite direction. So that enables, uh, that helps to enable, uh, define the degree of crystallinity, uh, even for kind of adding a degree of complexity beyond whether or not it's saturated or unsaturated. Yes. Did you say that when there are no double, it's fully saturated? Correct. So like what we have up here above, 
uh, the animal fat, that's a fully saturated fatty acid. These two are uh, unsaturated, but you can appreciate that one has a kink and one doesn't. And that's because of the nature of these double bonds. Yes. Not a higher degree. They're both. Uh, uh, you're, uh, re yes. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine that if you continue to add more and more double bonds, that it can actually induce uh, more and more kinking in the fatty acid. So if you think for a moment, uh, looking at these four, uh, these four different uh, fatty acids, uh, you you might wonder. It, it might it might be helpful to think which pair of two would be good to have in our cell membrane. Would the bottom two or the top two be best to have within our cell membrane? Does anyone? Uh, so for the sake of time, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, step in. So the bottom two is what we would want phospholipid bilayer because of their kinking. So again, the kinking in these fatty acid tails uh, reduces the crystallinity, the degree of ordering. And what that does is it enables movement within the lipid bilayer. So if you think for a moment on the previous slide, the saturated, uh, the saturated fatty acid was animal fat, okay? At, uh, at, colder temperatures, let's say, if you put animal fat in the fridge, what happens to it? What state is it in? If you put olive oil in the fridge, what state is it in? It's liquid. And that's because of the degree of crystallinity, the, the degree of ordering and the kicking, because it enables these, it, it enables more movement between them. And so similarly, Within our membrane, if we had all uh, steric acid fatty uh, fatty acid tails within our uh, phospholipids, they would be stacking against each other, not permitting much movement at all. That high degree of crystal so high degree of crystallinity enables very uh, ver very little movement or no movement at all. Kinking in these fatty acid tails uh, reduces crystallinity because if you just imagine trying to stack a bunch together. Uh, with all of these kinks in them, or even more so, I'll go to I'll go back to the uh, next slide. Uh, these bottom two, particularly arachidonic acid, which is in our cell membrane, if you try and stack a bunch of these together, there's going to be a lot of free space for them to move around and for things to move around or uh, uh, traverse through them. However, if it was uh, myristic acid or palmitic acid, that high degree of crystallinity will not enable free movement of uh, proteins on the cell membrane if they're, if, the, if they're there. Yes? Would not the structure at the bottom two, excuse me, would not the uh, structure at the bottom two prevent the formation of a bilayer? Uh, no. So the, this is just one, the, uh, this is just the fatty acid, the fatty acid tail. If you remember, we still have a glycerol group a phosphate group and the alcohol. So, if uh, if this was the, if if all of that together was the uh, made up the phospholipid, this is still hydrophobic. And then if you had another because it's a phospholipid bilayer, what would end up happening is that you they're both hydrophobic, so they'd be turning in. But this degree saturation would enable a fluid like nature that's good for our cell membrane. Yes. Yes. Crystallinity with respect to the whole molecules, as as opposed to specifically looking at that bond. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. With the with the top, the top two that are unsaturated, 
Yeah. Exactly. Um, so some of you all might uh, be aware, uh, or some of you might recognize uh, omega as it relates to fatty acids. Omega is typically referred to the first nth carbon uh, after which you find the first double bond. So this alpha uh, linolenic acid is an omega-3 because at the, at the third carbon, we have our first double bond. And with arachidonic acid, at the sixth carbon, we have our first double bond. So this would be arachidonic acid omega-6. Uh, going back to a question earlier about cholesterol and its contribution to fluidity, uh, what uh, cholesterol plays an important part to fluidity as it relates to um, changes in different temperatures. So if we're looking down, facing down uh, on a phospholipid bilayer, looking at the polar head groups, if we wedged in, and if you can imagine, if, uh, so if looking at this, this has a high degree of crystallinity. Uh, so it would not enable much movement for proteins present there. If we wedged in a cholesterol, what will end up happening is that that'll alter and disrupt that degree of crystallinity and kind of help enable uh, more easy, more easy movement throughout this uh, lipid bilayer, particularly at lower temperatures. This is what this does is it lowers the energy threshold for movement. Um, so the there is a higher threshold to uh, there's a, kind of like a higher obstacle or a higher degree of energy needed to enable movement here. Wedging in a cholesterol here lowers that energy threshold for movement. And what ends up happening is it, and it makes it easier for proteins and cell members to move around throughout, uh, particularly at low temperatures. What ends up happening at higher temperatures is that uh, the lipid bilayer will start to space out a little bit. But what's helpful is that the presence of cholesterol through its hydrophobic interactions with the fatty acid tails will help keep some of these, uh, some of these phospholipids together helping to, in order to uh, maintain its structure. And so at lower temperatures, uh, it helps to maintain fluidity. Uh, and at higher temperatures, it helps to reduce it uh, to try and make sure that there is, uh, through its hydrophobic interactions, to maintain the integrity of the cell membrane. Uh, finally, there are these, uh, the cholesterol, there are particularly uh, enriched portions of our cell membrane that have cholesterol, and we typically refer to them as lipid rafts. Uh, these cholesterol-rich lipid rafts are uh, really fascinating spaces where there are these like uh, highly uh, active regions of the cell membrane where a lot of signal transduction happens. And so we have uh, these GPI-anchored proteins that are also there, uh, different raft-associated transmembrane proteins that are there. And so the, the key takeaway from this slide is that regions of the cell membrane that are enriched for cholesterol are called lipid rafts, and they're these small domains where lots of signaling occurs. So in four minutes, we're gonna take this all and apply it to lupus. So we talked about before how uh, we have the fatty acid chain, the glycerol and the phosphate uh, group that makes the phosphatidic acid, and the alcohol defines the specificity of that phospholipid. So within our plasma membrane, there are some phospholipids that are on the outer leaflet and some that are restricted to the inner leaflet of our cell membrane. The phospholipid of interest that we're going to talk about in these closing minutes is phosphatidylserine, which is a inner leaflet, uh, inner leaflet phospholipid. Cells go through different kinds of death. Uh, one of the ways in which cells die is apoptosis. It's a programmed cell death uh, that is uh, associated also with this blebbing that we see on the outer surface of the cells. And typically, one of the triggers for that a cell, a cell is go undergoing apoptosis, not triggers, forgive me, one of the signs or one of the things that happen during apoptosis is that phosphatidylserine, this inner leaflet, phospholipid, flips out and is now on the outer surface, the outer leaflet of the cell membrane. Its presence on the outer leaflet is a sign or a cue indicating that this cell is undergoing apoptosis. So 
in our immune system, there are specific cells that are called uh, phagocytes uh, that go through phagocytosis. So again, breaking down a large word, phago usually means eating, site means cell, and osis is the process. So the process of eating cells. Phagocytes uh, eat cells. They are professional cell-eating cells. Um, and so usually when they see phosphatidylserine on the outer leaflet, that is a sign that uh, they can go through phagocytosis and engulf that, that cell that's dying and going through apoptosis. Uh, and uh, that is the typical way that cells that are dying are cleared out. This process, this phagocytosis, is uh, there are two, so uh, I want to make this very clear. There are two believed problems at play with lupus. Number one is a, a problem with phagocytosis where this dying cell that's flipped phosphatyl serine to the outside uh, is not being engulfed and eaten. And this blebbing inside the blebs are actually nuclear proteins. So problem one is that uh, the garbage men go on strike, meaning that the phagocytes are not doing their job of clearing out these dying cells that have phosphatyl, phosphatyl serine flipping to the outside. So problem one, phagocytosis is dysfunctional. Problem two is that we now have nuclear proteins that are present extracellularly and through some sort of genetic, uh, through some uh, genetic uh, mutation, we're trying to stop saying mutation, but I'm just gonna say that now. Uh, the, uh, these patients also have autoantibodies against those nuclear proteins. So problem one, these cell uh, phagocytes are not clearing out these cells. And because they're not being cleared out, their blebbing is releasing nuclear proteins. Problem two, there are autoantibodies recognizing these nuclear proteins as foreign. And so what ends up happening is that uh, these patients end up going through a chronic immune, a uh, chronic inflammatory state where, again, we have cells everywhere in our body and all cells have nuclear proteins. So there could be really uh, robust inflammatory issues going on throughout. Uh, so with that being said, if autoimmunity or cell death or particularly lupus interests you, uh, Kenneth Tung is a professor here that's studying autoimmunity. Uh, in addition, uh, Cornelius is a new professor at the University of Pennsylvania that's studying particularly cell death and using some really cool tools. And so this is all to try and introduce you to different people who are answering these questions at UVA and elsewhere. With that, I went uh, about a minute and a half over, forgive me, but thank you for your time. That's great. Give me one second.